All righty. Can uh, we have a couple people share uh, topics for today? <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that? Okay. Um, uh, Rudolf Steiner talks a lot about root souls, like what to do with animals and birds and other. You know, maybe you could touch on root souls. It's not something I feel you've ever spoken root about souls. in the last ten or fifteen years. Okay, possibly. <laughs> what did you were back there? Somebody said. <laughs> what? Breath of joy. Okay, that's enough. <laughs> okay, thank you. Hmm. Quite the alphabet soup today. <laughs> it matters not. Um, onward, upward we go. So today, um, everything from purity, emotional body, even fear was brought up. Um, relations, peace. Um, you know, it's very interesting. The, the world is obviously challenging a lot of people right now. And, um, and it's so interesting to watch people trying to figure out what they're supposed to be doing. You know, some are sort of losing their mind, their heart, losing, you could call faith. Others are going looking for that. Um, here we might have a blend of those. We might have people that are soul searching and afraid, and uh, other people might just gravitate to what we're doing here because they feel a sense of peace. We have people from all around the world watching, and there are so many topics we could cover, and so many topics people do cover. Most people don't cover as many topics, right, as we cover, because we cover everything here. I mean, we've talked about light beings and multi-dimensionality, ascension, and healing, fear, trauma, post-trauma syndrome, everything that needs to be covered, we cover. And that's because there is, everything that is should be understood by God's children. There should be nothing that has power over us or that we sit around floating in as victims. We're co-creators of this entire universe. So there shouldn't be a topic where we scratch our heads and say, gee, I, I don't get it. So, so we t cover so many topics to, I guess you could say, illuminate, bring light to these topics. One thing I see happening is this topic of faith. I've talked about faith before. So you can go, and I think it's in one of our DVD sets, so you can look that up. But it's interesting to me because there, with all the topics that, that are you know, presented or experienced on planet Earth, so many of them are misunderstood. You could throw out a word like freedom, and there's people that don't understand it, and they, they spew the words all the time, but they don't understand. Uh, the words um, innocence, it's given this connotation of naivete or uh, gullible or uh, susceptible to hurt innocence, you see? It, it, people don't understand. Innocence means I don't have anything in me at all that would be aggressive or could draw aggression, aggression to me. This is this perfect light. The same as the sun sitting out in the middle of a universe not being afraid of the dark. It's not like the sun's like, I'm so overwhelmed by the darkness of this universe. It's just shining light. And that's what innocence is like, purity is like. So the concept of faith is also a very misunderstood topic. Um, you know, science will say faith is for the gullible, superstitious people. Religion's gonna say faith is, and this is kind of a funny one, because religion will say you cannot have a direct experience with God. So what we recommend is faith. <laughs> faith in God. Don't have a direct experience, just pretend it's not approachable and they have faith in it. It's really kind of strange. Um, you know, it's like showing you a scary movie and then telling you not to be afraid. It, it's like kind of odd. Just have faith. Faith is interpreted as kind of hoping things will go your way. 
And, and yet people act like that's profound. Well, we're just having faith. Some people think faith is the name of your religion. They'll say, what is your faith? You should just say yes. No, no, I mean, what is your religion? Yeah, absolutely. What is your faith? You know, absolutely. You know, it, it's, they should just say, what is your religion, if that's what they want to know, but they'll use the word faith interchangeably with religion. But that's not so because religion, again, is training you to have what's called hope that there's something, not knowing, but hope. So that's kind of odd. Push it away and then tell me to believe in it. That's religion. Say that it can't be proven, that's science. So do, do I care about either of those? No, I really don't. Back to the knowingness of God. So let's think of the contrast between faith and faithlessness. You could think faithlessness, mean, and, and by the way, faith means I have faith in the truth of God. I mean, that God is. God is the only power. God is the only thing that's real. So that's not like, I call this the faith of the crossed fingers. You know, it's like, I, I, you know, Jesus on the cross, people have, they have a, a religions related to crucifixion or cross, the cross. I call it the religions of crossed fingers because they don't know God. They're just hoping, right? They're just hoping, which is sad in a sense. I'm just hoping. You're hoping for what? That God is, but God is. Let's just start knowing it. Let's just start owning it. God is actually all that's true and real. So own it, know it. Jesus never offered a healing to person, to a person and said, you know, uh, now you are healed. And then went, come on, come on, come on. Healed, come on, healed. It, it never, that never happened. The, the, the faith of the crossed fingers. No, that's hoping. You're hoping something comes through. Now I want to add, when you're struggling with fear, and, and other things, you know, th things of the emotional self, the emotional body, the world in crisis. It's better to have hope than nothing. So there's faithlessness where you could say, I, I don't have anything, and that's very scary. So then you can say, well, all I have is hope. I think that's better than nothing. So I, I would not tell you to abandon all hope. Go from hopeless to hope, but as we evolve, we go from religious hope to knowing. And that's a bit more of the way of the mystic, the way of the master. And it's the truth of God. I mean, it is the truth of God. How beautiful in that. I'm not, I'm not counting on something that I hope will come through. It's the truth of God. An absolute knowing. So faithlessness is an interesting term if you think about it, because we think that means I don't have a religion or I don't have like a hope that something's going to come through or I'm not having enough faith in God that God's going to help me in a situation. Well, the trick is, as we call on the Holy Spirit and you say, Holy Spirit of God or God or Jesus or whatever, uh, I have a loved one, a child, and it's ill. Please help them. It's interesting because your prayer is a faithless prayer. Now, I'm not saying you don't have hope. You're hoping that God will help them. But God's not going, say, please. You know, God's not like thinking about it. God's going, I'm sorry, what were you asking? I'm asking you to help my child. They're sick. God's saying, you think your child's sick. You are mentally ill. <laughs> Why would you say that, God? Because you think your child's sick. Faith means you would know it's impossible for them to be sick. And now they would be healed. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus never saw a sick person and asked God to fix them. That is a prayer of faithlessness. And, and it's tricky wording, so please bear with. Faith, I'm using in the context, faith in the truth of God. Faith that the truth of God is and there's nothing else which really isn't faith traditional terminology, it's a knowing. So you have a, a faith hoping and a faith knowing. And I highly recommend the faith knowing. And it can sound very confusing to say, well, Michael just said, if I pray for someone to be helped, it's faithless. I mean, what a 
Wow, that's a strong phrase to be sharing uh, on a Sunday sacred service. But it's true. When you say, my child is, is an addict, God, please help them. I know you're trying to be all nice and, you know, helpful to your child. I'm, I'm just being a concerned mom or dad or whatever. Listen to your words. You're saying, God, listen. Lord, in case you haven't noticed, I'm just giving you some updates from planet Earth because I know that you're busy and you probably don't catch it all. My child's an addict and I would like you to help them. Please, 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 or whatever term you, oh, money, pod me, any terminology, any chanting, chiming, ringing of bells, you're still saying, I'm asking God to believe the impossible. I'm asking God to agree with me that my child is an addict, that they're out of control, they can't choose their sexual preference, or whatever you think is their problem. My child's now male, female, it, something or other. You know, there's all these different names. You, you, and you want to label it as a problem. Then you're trying, when you pray, you're trying to actually get God to agree with you. Oh, I, I hadn't noticed. You're right, your child is really out of control. We need to do something about this. And here comes an answer to a prayer and your child's going to be converted, healed, or whatever. That's not how this works. It is impossible for God to perceive or see or experience flaw. So when you ask God to help fix people that are sick, you're asking God to agree that they're sick and then to fix them. God's going, I, I have a different idea. How about you rise to my consciousness where you can't see them as sick and then they'll be whole? No, 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 no. I, don't, I didn't ask for any opinions, God. I want you to fix my child. And if you're any kind of God, you would clearly have the compassion I have. You should be more like me, God, a concerned mother. And that's your attempt to, to twist and, and really pervert what God is. How about we ask the Holy Spirit to take our consciousness to a level where there is no sickness? I'm saying this. If you perceive flaws in people, it's called judgment. I don't mean the kind of judgment because that's another word that's misused. We think that judgment is when you're simply judging someone angrily. You know, you're such a jerk. Oh, that's a judgment. See, that's too overt. If I think you are anything less than God created you to be, I am actually placing a judgment. We think judgment is judging the reaction or as a reaction. Judgment is also known as an opinion. When I think you're flawed, which by the way is impossible. It's impossible for you to be less than holy. Then some people say, oh, what he's saying is God accepts us as we are. No, I didn't say that. The us that we think we are is all messed up. It's all messed up. Oh, um, never mind. It's, it's all messed up. You get it? So this is all messed up. I didn't say God, God looks at us and goes, you know, and people sing songs and they have poems that say, and God loves us just the way we are. And we think it means we're messed up and God just simply accepts us. I didn't say that. I'm saying us being messed up is actually a fallacy. It's an illusion. We're just make-believing that we're messed up. So God simply doesn't choose to look at the make-believe world. It says, how you doing? Oh, I'm all messed up. Well, wow, that's interesting. How long do you want to do that? It doesn't get into the details of it because it knows this is a play. All the world's a stage and everyone's playing these parts, strange parts, twisted parts. When we think we're growing spiritually and we have epiphanies, in a way, all we're really doing is getting over ourselves. You know, we're just kind of peeling off opinions of ourselves. I had this major awakening and now I, I'm realizing that I'm a worthy child of God, you're actually peeling off the unworthy. The worthiness isn't something we attained. It's that we let go of the unworthy. The healed is not what happened. God doesn't say, okay, now I'm going to give you a healing. God simply holds that you can't be sick. When we get to the state of consciousness where we accept that, we're healed. So it's really not God giving healing. God giving graces. It's really us learning to accept them. One of you asked about the, the word peace, but also grace. 
And that's what grace is. It's, it's the truth of God. It's not something bestowed because you became deservable after being so naughty. You finally achieved a, you know, the grace of God. The grace of God means I'm not in the way anymore. How can I not be in the way? Practicing love and self-worth. Forgiveness of all things that I would hold to be true other than God. So faithlessness, put another way, faith, you know, faith means I agree that God's, I agree with God's reality. Faithlessness means that I choose anything but God's reality. Because if you believe in a world having power over you, and there is no world, therefore it doesn't have power, that's called faithlessness. Because you're putting faith in something that isn't even there. See, it's not like I'm talking about you're naughty because you don't have enough faith. That's a religious view. I'm saying from the spiritual viewpoint, as I accept God's truth, that's an act of faith, not hope, faith. Because it is all that's true. When I choose to focus, obsess on, you know, put attention on anything of this world, it's faithlessness. Examples could include, I have, and by the way, there's only one type of faith, the reality of God. Sadly, faithlessness can take all kinds of forms. So once again, we're outnumbered. That seems so unfair. There's only one kind of faith and a zillion kinds of faithlessness. It's like a needle in a haystack vibe, isn't it? I'm just hoping I find the right one. Well, the good news is only one of them is real. So if that needle is buried in all this hay of illusion, and somewhere in that haystack is, is my proverbial needle, which is the faith, a truth of God. How do I find it? Do I keep one lifetime after another through the hay until I find it? Maybe, if that's what you want to do. You could also call to it and turn it on, make it become beep, beep. It's easier to find. You get that? Oh, wait. I hear you, God. I hear you. It's, get it to call out to you. And to do that, it's called prayer. You're setting a tone. Prayer is not just words as we think it is. Another misunderstood topic. But it's more like the, all these words are rooted in one sound. That sound can be calling for help. That sound can be calling for consciousness. But it's your intention behind all the words. Instead of God, give me this. God, give me this. God, you know, help me with this. And please help them, take them away. Bring them back. You know, strange Sears and Roebuck catalog of life. I want this. I don't want this. I'm returning this. I'm exchanging that. You know, like, wow. Spiritual Walmart or Amazon or whatever you, you know you use to shop. And instead, instead it goes to a place of, wait, wait. Underneath all of those words, ooh, it's just a sound, perhaps, a tone, a chant, whatever. And then, like, it could even be a mantra. But under that, there's this frequency that goes and finds the thing you're looking for, activates it, and it starts calling back. Now, how am I going to hear it if I'm making too many even spiritual tones and sounds and mantras? Be quiet. This is my talking to God, and this is God coming back to me. This is called prayer. This is called meditation. Stop and listen. So that's called communion, when you mix the two. My sharing and my hearing. My, my praying and my meditating. My giving, my receiving. That together is called communion with God. So yes, it can happen. But if I'm obsessing on all the other strands of hay, it's not as likely. I've shut off my mind to hear the voice of God. That's not happening. If I'm praying at all, I'm praying about how tired I am of looking at all the hay. <laughs> Can't believe it. Another relationship. <laughs> you know, and onto another strand or bundle of hay and looking, looking for this needle. And it's like, wow, no, 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 no. There's got to be another way. So when we focus in this world and say, um, my child is ill, it's called faithless. I'm not criticizing your attempt because your attempt I'm calling hope. There's hopelessness. There's no sense in praying because it doesn't matter. That's really, really dark place to be. 
But then there's hope. I'm hoping that God will heal my child. That's better than nothing. I agree with that totally. Do it. I wouldn't shame you. I wouldn't say don't do it. Go for it. I'm just saying there's another category. And the other category is faith. The middle category technically is faithless because you're, you're giving power to a world that isn't there. Therefore, by definition, it is not real. It is called an illusion. It's not faith. It's faithlessness. I'm putting faith in something that isn't there. there so it, you could say it's faithless is like a word of, you know, faith that is worthless. It has no place. It has no value. It has no reality. And not everybody is ready for that level of consciousness. So when people come to you, somebody says, I need a hug, and you hug them, you actually engaged with their faithlessness. They were saying, what I need is a physical act. Give that to me. But you engaged in faithlessness because the truth is they need nothing. They only need God. So what should you do? Somebody comes to you and says, I just lost my family. Please hold me. No, 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 no. You just need to turn within and find God. See, that would be an act of coldness, even though it sounds truthfully spiritual. It's spiritual truth. This is what's interesting. Someone will say to you, I, I need medicine. No, 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 that's faithless. And there are religions and thought systems that have done that, watching people die because they refused medicine. They were trying to just have faith in God. God's like, take the medicine. <laughs> you know, but you can't hear it. So people are going to say, there's this, there's this illness, but I trust that God will fix it. You already said there's an illness. If you want to really practice faith, there is no illness. So go to that place. OK, I'm going to go there. Um, I'm totally in a state of faith, so I don't believe in any illness. Do you still eat and drink? Yes. Then you might not be over it yet. Don't put too much on yourself and say, I have to be totally faithful from now on. No eating, no sleeping, no drinking, because I know that it's all an illusion and I'm going to walk in the faith and truth of God. Instead, what's important is when you're struggling and you see people hurting or yourself and you're saying, I'm going to pray to God for some help here. I would say to you, there must be a certain amount of God missing or you wouldn't have a problem, an illness, a lack of any kind. Right? In God, you can't be missing anything. So I'm asking for some help with this. I would say to you, why don't you try, before you ask for something of this world to happen, ask for forgiveness for perceiving that that had power. Say to yourself, I see this person sick. Instead of God fix my poor child, stop and participate. Hey, God, I believe my child is sick. But I know in you that can't happen. So I must be having slipped out of your consciousness. So I'm asking that you help us join, they and I, together in the knowingness of God. And that's a profound moment in heaven. A child of God remembered the truth. That's, it's profound stuff. It's like uh, this quaking happens in heaven. Can you know, help me rise to the level of consciousness where there is no illness. Oh, but my child's an addict. And then you'll recite all the things your CODA meeting tells you. You'll recite all the things that their NA group or AA group tells you about them. And you'll create all kinds of labels. And I didn't say don't have the labels. I'm just saying once you've memorized those, hey, how's your daughter? You know, how's your son? How's Oh, you know, they're an addict, and they're in NA, and they're in AA, and here come the labels. And you know what you're doing? Confirming, 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 confirming all the untruths about them. And I'm calling that faithless, because it is not truth. It is truthless. What I should be doing is, God, how would you have me see them? Holy, as holy as Jesus himself. First and foremost, that child is, holy. oh, but you don't understand my child. Oh, you yeah, know, they're addicted and they do this. They stole money from me. Here come the labels again. So you know who needs healed? You, the parent. Okay. It's not helping to thrive on these labels. I'm asking to see my child as you see them. And oh my God, 
there's a quickening that happens in the heart of the divine mother when a human being says, help me to see them through the mother's love. See, then you can't see them as flawed. You will acknowledge that that's what they seem to be doing. And that's okay. That's what they seem to be. It's not who they are. And we're all connected. We're all connected spiritually. We're not even disconnected to be called connected. There is only this oneness. However, we're not only connected in spirit, even vibrationally and even genetically. And so if I'm a parent of someone, that person is not just holding genetics. Genetics communicate. Genes, cells, all communicate. That's been proven. There's a wonderful book you, some of you might recall from way back, Secret Life of Plants, where there was you know, evidence shown that plants respond, even, even plants respond to when a person comes in to water and feed them versus rip them apart. The plants, they can, with sensitive equipment, they could tell that the plants were responding to uh, you walking in the room because you're loving plants. So you don't think humans do that? Humans sense each other. We're all connected. Well, genes, cells communicate and genes communicate. So if I have a child genetically connected with me and I, in my very being, think that they're flawed, they're weak, they're addicted, they're hopeless, they're going to die, uh, you know, something's going to happen bad to them, that frequency is downloading to them. You didn't just give them mom, dad genes, you're giving them consciousness constantly. So you can actually say, I refuse to believe that anymore, because that is a belief that is faithless. Instead, I think I'm going to go with uh, believing the truth of God. That's faith. I'm not hoping, although hoping is a nice step out of completely nothing. Hoping and then on to knowing this. I get it. It is absolutely impossible for them to be all these flawed images. God, I get it. Thank you. Thank you for holding myself and my child in that perfection of that light. Show me now how to do that as well. I want to be a co-creator with you. And so you just, it's not like you have to go, okay, I'm, I'm picturing them knitting instead of doing a needle. You know, it's not like you have to make up pretty pictures of them. Although that's fine if you do. I'm talking about holding light image, not fun details. I'm seeing my child doing better things for their health. Uh, I want them to eat the way I think they should eat. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking beyond details. Who are they? Perfect, holy light. Hmm. And every time my head starts to go, yeah, but shh, there they are. And your head's going to go, really? But they, but, but it, shh. Be still and know the I am presence of God. In God, in you, in your child. Wow, we're just all, and, and it's downloading. It's downloading. Your child is somewhere, probably journaling about you. <laughs> you know, mother and she just never has any faith in me. And they're going to be sitting there and, and a light bulb's going to go off. Bing! And they're not going to go to know why. But something just happened. Mom, dad changed consciousness and it downloads in genetics. It does. It also uploads back into your ancestry. Well, you know, I'm a certain race, I'm a certain culture. We tend to, we tend, you know, low finances. We tend to this and we tend to drink and stop. Holiness, holiness, holiness. And somewhere, five generations ago, in Ireland, Argentina, Madagascar, or wherever. They're sitting there making soup and... <laughs> what just happened? Oh, I must have had some gas or something. Yeah. You know, something, what, what was that, you know? Uh, maybe it was an aneurysm. I am getting older. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? They're, they're not going to know what it was. But their descendant sent them love and forgiveness, love and healing, peace and joy, God, God's presence. And 
If you go back and change them five generations ago, it'll mean that that will trickle down to you and you will be raised to a new level of consciousness. And all you did was choose to be faithful. Faithful meaning that no matter what this world tells me, it isn't true. Only God, only the truth is true. And only God is true. So what do I do about these other things? Do I just walk around going, that's not happening? No, no, no. Um, people are going to ask, your body is going to ask to be fed. It's an illusion. Should you not do it? What about people that, that say, you know, um, I, I need a hug. I want you to hug me. Uh, mommy, I want you to hold me if it's a kid of yours. You know, whatever the case may be, when the human self, the mortal self that thinks that it's a flawed, limited being, when it tells you it needs something, it's never true. It's already off its rocker. It already thinks it's a flawed self. Why would we think it's important to listen to its opinions? And this is where it gets tricky. Logically, you'll, if you heard me correctly, you will hear me saying, don't give in to the self. Don't give in to the ego self. Because all faith is either in God or the ego. Ego meaning your mortal limited self or anything of that categorization. So it's God or anything else. Those are the two things you can be faithful towards. Well, let's agree that we, oh man, we love this thing about faith in God and the truth of God. Let's go there, right? Can we kind of agree that's important? Yes. Great. Then what about everything else? Whenever you give into it and see somebody as flawed, when you see color on skin, when you see gender, anything you see that is not the divine light of God, it's a limited version of somebody. Therefore, it's faithlessness to get caught up in it. Oh, look at that person. They look like they haven't eaten in so long. There you go. So we could say, in one respect, honestly and accurately, we could say, don't give in to the body. Don't, get, don't eat just because you feel a compulsion to eat. Don't, don't tell God to fix people just because you thought they looked pretty bad. It's all faithlessness. That's true. But even God would not tell you to live that way. It's going to sound like a contradiction, but it isn't. It's just a paradox. God's going to say, yesterday you said, look at that person looks terrible. Oh, poor thing. And you ignored them. That's faithlessness. You not only found flaw in them, you didn't do anything about it because you tried to be neutral. It's called being agnostic. I'm not going to believe either way. It's still of the ego. Then on another day, let's say, you see somebody that looks terrible and you're now, because now you found God. Um, I'm going to do the right thing. I'm not going to just ignore that homeless person that looks, you know, disheveled and, and hungry and dirty and whatever. I'm going to be the spiritual guy. God, fix them. You know, that's the religious person. I don't care if you ohm it, Christian it, or whatever. It's still a step in the right direction, but it isn't there yet. God's going to say to you, would you like my feedback on what you might want to do? Sure. God's going to say, okay. When you see that person, are you experiencing holiness? Well, no, because look at the way they, I didn't ask you to explain it. Do you see holiness? Well, no, but look at the way, I don't have your eyes. I don't see them the way you see them. You're allowing your senses to determine a holy child of God is less than holy. You're messed up. They're just a test for you. That could have been an angel looking all disheveled to help you see that your seeing is off. You are blind. Would you like to have your eye opened and see them? Yes. Oops. Yes. I see that I was off. I was not seeing them as God sees them. And now I want to see them as God sees them. As you see them, God, show me. And it isn't like, oh, look, they have a bath. They took a bath and they're cleaner. That's not... That's not how God sees. It's a feeling. All of a sudden, you can't, your eyes start to actually close and your other eye opens when you ask to see as God. So you don't have clients coming to you with ailments that you fix. You don't have children that you're praying to have fixed. You don't see disheveled people look cleaner. What happens is it's the coolest thing and the strangest is it's kind of like you don't bother looking at them anymore. 
You don't bother letting your senses determine what you're experiencing with that person. They can be a raging, you know, a raging person. And all of a sudden, you're not aware of the raging. Something else you're evoking in them gets your attention and you see it with higher senses. This particular, the third eye. You start to see them, third eye is related to your pineal pituitary, which are your two highest glands. But they also symbolize your two highest chakras, which symbolizes your highest consciousness. So when I open the third eye and see them differently and ask God to help me see them differently, technically God or the Holy Spirit of God is awakening the divine in me. So you say namaste, but people don't even know what it means. It's, it's just so cool though, you know, namaste. You don't look very good today. Namaste. You know, and, and that shirt's not your color. Namaste. It, do, it doesn't work. It's not real. Namaste is, in a sense, and there's various interpretations of it, but I'm using the simplistic one. It's like an affirming that I choose to see the divine in you through the divine in me. I'm asking to see you not with these eyes. Because these eyes will say, you know, you're hot or you're out of shape or whatever. These eyes are going to tell me what I think about you in terms of your looks. You know, like I'm some line checking out, you know, a, a, a sick antelope or whatever. You will serve me well today. Kind of good looking. Mm. Or you will serve me well today. I'm in the mood to find flaws with other people. Wow, look at you. You should go to the gym like I do. It's all, it's all off. So how can I see you? And then these eyes, show, this eye opens and... Oh my God, you know, there's a glory when we see people from a higher spiritual perspective. Something, you know, incredible happens. This other world starts just falling away and reality shows up. So here's what happens. If I see you as flawed, I'm not asking to, to fix my perception. I can just ask to see you as you really are. Or I can use the words, God help me to see them as you see them. And that'll cover it. I don't have to figure out what that is. I don't have to set the goal and head for it. It's better that I stay out of it. I don't know how to see your holiness. Even when you're going to make love with somebody. Well, I already see them pretty well, you know. I mean, it's obviously attracting me enough that way. No, ask to see them differently. Ask, how would you have me see them, God? And some of us are going to go, well, thanks. That brought God into it. Now I'm out of the mood. <laughs> well, then you shouldn't be doing it. How would you have me see them differently? That is not just making love. It's sharing love. You're sharing a holy joining, even at that level. So here's the tricky thing, though. Again, if I'm hungry and I eat, I just gave in to the compulsion for the limited, unreal self, my body that thought it was hungry. Where's my divine self here? When I see somebody that looks just disheveled, when I choose to make love, or whatever we do in our lives, all of those things are feeding the ego. They're feeding the limited perception. None of them are true. You don't have a body. You can't be intimate that way. You don't have a body. You can't eat food. You don't have a stomach. I just want a house improved. You don't have a house. I want the planet to have peace. There is no planet. It's all a hologram. There's only us dreaming these things up so we can see how we're doing in our remembrance process. Okay, so what do I need? Okay, I get it, Michael. Let's assume any of you say, I get it. I, I believe you. Thank you. Now I feel worse. <laughs> because I realize that I'm, I'm living a faithless life. I'm, my faith is in this world that if... If there's an illness, it can get me. That's faithless. Oh, but I don't believe that. I believe there's medicine that can help. That's faithless. Because you think a thing will fix a thing. Neither exists. So what do we do? Here's what we do. We forgive ourselves for having assumed that we knew. We forgive ourselves for perceiving the disheveled person. We forgive ourselves for calling our children addicts. That was not very kind. I understand that's what they might be doing. It's not who they are. So when you practice forgiveness, you're anchoring the light of God into an unholy place, making it holy. I, I kind of, you know, was, was looking at you as a, as a potential 
hookup or partner or life mate or whatever you're looking, you know. People are thinking soulmates are gonna be the answer. Nothing can help from the outside because nothing outside exists. So all it does is lead to more problems. How do we heal it? How do we fix get, get better problems? No. Just say, I was mistaken. I was mistaken to think my child was that. It's not who they are. Show me who they really are and help me to find forgiveness for myself for believing that. So when I practice forgiveness for all of my misperceptions, I'm actually bringing light in that wasn't there. It was always there, but not seen. So practicing forgiveness restores our vision. Practicing forgiveness brings us to the consciousness we could have been at in the first place. If I would have seen things from this place, everything would have been different. But I did not see things from this place. Why? Because I was living in a consciousness of judgment, which is a hard word for some people to accept. But I was. Not just the emotional judgment of the other person. Even thinking that they were flawed in any way is a judgment, an opinion. And thank God you were mistaken. Is that making sense? The gratitude that that other soul feels, and it could be even your parents who might have been very hurtful. They might have passed on. So how do I do this with them? It's very simple. It's the same thing. Close your eyes, just as if it's a person still in your life. Close your eyes and own what happened. I, I saw my parents as A, B, and C. That is what seemed to be. That's okay to say that. But it's not who they are. The truth of the matter is, anyone that's ever hurt you in any way could never have known who they really were when they did what they did. That's a fact. They could not have known their divinity and done what they did. Which then leads us to understand, maybe it's because they forgot who they are that made them do those things. If they can't do them knowing who they are, I wonder if it's true that not knowing who they are is what makes people act the way they act. So if that, and do, you, do we agree that that's a likelihood? Then the, then the solution is what? Maybe if someone helps them to remember, you will bring that person healing. That's what has to happen. And how? To say, God, how would you have me see them? Through your eyes. You bring them healing by bringing the consciousness of God to the moment. So now when we do that and someone wants a hug, give them the hug. If they need medicine, give them the medicine. Play the game, but first correct your mind. That's the trick. It's not either or. Well, Michael said it's all in faith in who they are. And, and that's where some people have made a religion or thought system around do not do medicine, do not do any healing arts because that confirms faithlessness. They're right. But they're wrong about shaming compassion and care for people. So ultimately, and I'm coming to a close, ultimately, there's a very beautiful thing, and you've heard me say many times, know the truth but respect the illusion. So what has to happen is the child that needs picked up, they're crying, instead of saying, oh, what's your problem? Get over it, Junior. You know, that's, that's not going to help. The person that needs seems to need help. They're saying to you, I've forgotten who I am, and it's causing me pain. We can mentally say, God, how would you have me see them through your eyes? And then you'll get guidance as to take a hand, to hand a tissue, to hug. It's amazing. You'll still do the deeds. You'll still do things. Someone comes to you for surgery, you still do surgery. But you're changing your mind and half of them will walk out without needing the surgery. But those who still do, so what? That's where they're at. So the ultimate healing comes from us choosing to see people as they really are, but also acting in accordance with, with what they think they need for now. If your partner needs um, medication to, to calm them down, you don't meet with them and say, you know, you should really get over that, that need. They should say, well, I should get over needing to live with you. Goodbye. <laughs> you know, I mean, let's hand it out equally then. <laughs> so 
Just imagine how, think about how, what I just said, how beautiful this is. If they say, I need a hug and you hug them, that's faithlessness. If they say, I need a hug, you correct your mind and then you hug them, it's called faith. What was the difference there? Bringing God into the picture, that's all. This, this thing, this person I think I am, should not be the one making the decisions. When and who to make love with, when and who to, to hug, when and who to eat, wh whatever you know it happens to be, what foods to eat or whatever. You know, should I go out to dinner with you? It's not like I'm telling you to sit down and you do like five ceremonies processes to decide, you know, whether I should eat with you or, you know, or marry you or whatever. You do what feels right, but what I'm saying is you get the mind corrected. It, it seems to me, and I think sometimes you'll have these really kind of humorous epiphanies, such as like, um, you know, wow, like when I really look and do tracking, this isn't one issue. This, I have patterns and patterns of stuff going on. No wonder my mind is programmed to think this way. I need this and I need this. I need something to sleep at night. I need something to wake me up. At I remember uh, as a kid, <clears throat> a couple of times, I, I hung out with Elvis Presley. And I was young enough to be looking at this. And I remember, I remember the people you know, uh, that knew him, you know, that were there and all that. Uh, the, uh, my dad was there. And, and I remember him, I'm going, what's this all about? Because he was these needles and these pills. And, and it was a private scenario, only the, literally a few. It wasn't an entourage party. It was only a few people. And so I was kind of going, what's this about? And I remember my dad saying, he has to have pills to wake up. He has to have drugs to go to sleep. He has to have drugs to get on stage. He has to have drugs to get off stage. He has to have drugs to go to the bathroom. This is what I was told as a kid. Okay, like wow, it, like I, I need something for anything I, I do. And that's just a good model of how out of control people can be. I need a person to feel loved. I need a food to feel full. I need all these things and they're all compulsions and we keep answering them. And when you answer them, you've affirmed the truth of the ego, which isn't true at all. You've affirmed the lies of the ego. That's why uh, the, the terminology Jesus used for the devil Satan and so forth in the New Testament, he, the, the term he used translated meant the liar. So just go with that. Instead of personifying it, you know, giving it some I, name and, and a thing, of, you know, uh, making it into a person, it's any, the liar, anything that makes you believe you're not holy is evil, a veil. It's a lie. And so what I'm really asking for is the truth of God. And as I start to find the truth of God, I start to find my faith, my trust and faith go into the truth of God. And lastly, remember this, that as I nurture a life that, that follows the truth of God, I'm becoming more faithful. And as I become more faithful, I start to follow more of the truth of God. This perfect ecosystem instead of the ego system that keeps telling me what you need is of the limited world because you're a limited being and it feeds and perpetuates itself. You're, you're, you're a flawed being. You're going to need a hug from someone that seems separate from you. You're going to need a drug from so, something that seems to stimulate or sedate your system. Just right. See, it's, it's a lie. But what do I do? How do I not believe it? I, okay, now I'm going to go and take the drugs because I need them, and now I feel bad about that. Don't take the drugs, and I feel bad about that. See? One leads you to being neurotic, the other towards depressed. No matter what I do, I'm losing. There's one answer. Catch it. Forgive yourself. <sighs> Once again, I see it. I was, I was thinking that I, I can't sleep and that I'm anxious, and I was thinking that, a pill, first of all, that's off. Then a pill was going to fix it. That's off. Yeah, but I take the pill and I go to sleep. It's just the make-believe world. Inside, I know better, and all I'm doing is building up more guilt and shame. I should be able to be beyond this. Stop. I get it. I see that this is part of big patterns of my uncertainty of who I am. I give all this to you, God. 
And what I really choose is to feel your presence. And your presence descends upon me in the form of forgiving myself. Forgive me, I know not what I was doing. I know not what I was thinking. And so it is. Or any other terminology you use. And so it is. Do seconds of a correction prayer. And all is done. Then take the pill. And if you hear your mind saying, yeah, but, but then it means you didn't sincerely do it. If you sincerely surrender your shames and guilts around having to take the pill to sleep or the hug to feel loved or whatever it happens to be, if you don't feel completely at peace with it, then you didn't sincerely do it. You'll know how much faith you have in God by how much peace you feel doing strange things like this. <laughs> you know? Isn't that interesting? You'll know how much God by how much you let yourself off the hook when you still need water once a day, a few times a day or whatever it is, you know? It's okay because I forgave myself. And you'll find that I'm applying this every day and you have so much extra time that you're also applying it to past events. What about that time that, that I bargained myself for a relationship? Oh, well, let's bring that one here. I feel like ashamed, I feel this, this, that whatever it is, this is part of a bigger pattern. I'm getting pattern, I'm giving it all to you, God. And what I really choose to feel is your holy presence. And I can actually affect time, forward and backward. So I can actually go back in time and tell little Michael or younger Michael or Sally or Sue or whoever we are, I can go back in time and say, what I really was looking for was the presence of God. I thought it was a person, so I moved in with them. But what I really wanted was God. So I'm going to give to myself what I really wanted, God. Now that old me, that past me, is sitting somewhere having, you know, making dinner for the person they hate. And, and, and a shift happens. You're, shift, you're healing, even back in time, your perceptions of that person. And it's not like we're denying that the person was hurtful or whatever. We're saying the effect it had is being lifted off. And now it's almost like I'm projecting back in time that I'm an angel standing there making dinner for this person. I'm not a wounded, limited, susceptible, vulnerable person, victim. I'm, I'm a holy person. And then it'll expand to where I'm, I'm so in the presence, so holy, that even the other person in the household is seen from a different place, a different level. So I went back in time and created a holy relationship in a holy household that didn't seem very holy at the time. And it doesn't matter to me. I'm moving forward and onward we go. You uproot that, you're changing things for today, but also for the future. We heal the past in the present to release the future. Please take a few centering breaths. Those of you who asked for specific topics, tune in, reflect back. We covered relationships, peace, fear, innocence, purity. Just soak it in, whatever answer you were looking for. Hmm. And in today's meditation, I am as God created me. I am as God created me. Breathe deeply as you hear the words, I am, on the exhale, as God created me. A couple times. Don't wish for it. Don't hope it's true. In your head, hear yourself saying, I know this. I really am as God created me. Make yourself step into really owning and believing it to be true. I am as God created me.
Now imagine this, we're gonna, today's exercise will be, meditation will be a few breaths we're going to practice. I would like you to imagine, I am as God created me and breathe backwards to where your back expands as you inhale. I am as God created me. And that means the metaphor is into your past. And so it is. Breathe forward, the whole front of your body, torso, everything forward, comes forward, bellows outward. I am into my future as God created me. Let's allow both sides, as we inhale, both sides of our body fill up and expand. This is to say all my perceptions of my, what was good and bad in my life, left and right, fully expanding, inhaling into this space, my past, rights and wrongs, my future, that I am as God created me. A breath that expands your crown to the sky, your feet towards the earth, inhaling. And this is all my highest and lowest perceptions. I'm taking this affirmation into all parts of my being. The next couple of breaths, all directions, forward, backward, side to side, top and down, everything. Everything expands, expanding with each breath. I am into all realms as God created me. A couple more times. There is no place that God is not. I am as God created me. And one more time, including all souls we're expanding to include all souls, ever created, all beings. I am, we are, as God created us to be. A quiet moment absorbing how that makes you feel, the effects colors you might see, feelings you might have, insights, just a sense of awe being in the God presence. But take just a moment. And in your own way, your own words, quietly give thanks that this is true. This experience is valid. It's true. It's happening. A change is setting in. Know it to be true. So it is. Beautiful. Remember, faith is simply accepting the truth of God. Faithlessness is when we succumb to the ego, which also means any limited perceptions of ourselves or others, right? That means I'm not having faith that people are holy. And that includes bad behaviors, but it also includes people that you're praying for, for healing and, and all your well-meaning things. It's still affirming a faithlessness. Is that all clear? All right. And our job, see it, forgive ourselves for that, and call in the presence of God to replace it. We're going to do our collection now and then our closing prayer. So I appreciate everyone being so beautiful and contributing in so many ways, the finances, but your presence, your prayers, your support. 
It's a strange topic in a sense because some of you are into healing arts. Some of you are chaplains. And you, you must have heard this before from me or from other teachings and teachers that when people come to you, don't pray to fix them. Pray to get not them fixed or healed. Pray to get your consciousness at a level where you can't see them as ill. Then you download that consciousness to your client and they walk away healed. But it's also true when people just need to share, you know, their sadness. And you can say, oh, they're, they're trying to suck me into believing in the limited effects of this world. Shh. Compassion. Be with them at the level they need, but never lose the consciousness being plugged in with God. Take your love offerings. Hold them to your heart. Be as generous as you can be. And the folks online, as generous as you can be. Thank you. We hold this to our heart and with absolute sincerity. <sighs> Divine love flowing through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. And so it is. Thank you. While they're passing those out, which will only take a minute or two, can anyone share what they learned or heard today that made the most sense or might be the most helpful to you? Yes. Right. Jesus giving thanks before he even saw the results of a, heal, of a prayer. Because he's already tapping into the truth. How could it take any other form? Very powerful. Yes. I have a belief. I know that what I believe, I create. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I, I've got this understanding about fear. It's an acronym. It means false evidence appearing real. Right. The effects of fear, the acronym false evidence appearing real. Yes. The center of global Christ consciousness <laughs> is I am. Nice. This, is, this, this center is a great expression of the I am presence of God. And so is the mind of everybody that feels an affinity to attending with us here. It's a very peculiar um, position to be in as a, as a teacher um, because um, we don't want it to be a thing, an ism, like most things that when you have a teacher, author, whatever. Um, so I sit with that and say, well, how, how do we have this where I'm downloading the presence of God to a group of people and it not be a person downloading to a group of you know people, uh, whatever. Because that's, we don't want the human interpretation of that. Do the same thing. Pray to see it from a higher place. And so I'm very clear that this is just like, it's as though there's a spirit ha happening here. There's something happening. I just happen to be the person stepping into that. So I know how to essentially divorce myself from believing or, or making myself a, a, um, a focal point. Does that make sense? I, I know in my mind I can easily do that. Um, it's the consciousness that we share. And uh, if I were living alone, walking this world alone, I would pretty much be doing the same thing. Having downloads, they happen. Whatever, you know, it could be driving through a drive-through and ordering french fries. I always have these conversations with God. I'm always having, you know, uh, humorous kinds of insights about life. You know, it's kind of, that's me. Um, deep, profound insights and humorous perspectives of this world. So that's going to happen anyway. And yet when I'm working with a, a group of people, they are contributing to whatever's happening here. Like, not only am I asking, what would you like me to talk about? And it's not like I'm asking because I'm codependent. I don't have to ask you. I'll just talk anyway. <laughs> you know, it's, it, I really, it's true. So, so we have an, an extraordinary thing happening. It can never become an ism or a religion. That, that's just not ever going to happen. 
And I would never want or allow that to happen. This is almost more like a training place to keep us fed, to know how to deal with the world when we go out individually. It's a bit more like that. It's not a, a you know, where I would want people just to sit and, and listen and focus on me. It's, uh, this is a training place. And um, I'm, I'm raised, every time I share with you, I'm raised to another level, and you're hopefully raised to another. This is about healing. This isn't lecturing. This is on one dimensional level. There's safety. We come together safely and also in a status of healing. Like our minds are being healed when we talk about the old stuff and laugh about it occasionally, cry about it occasionally. This is a very healing place, but it's not a healing center exclusively. It's a healing center and training and spiritual and meditative and consciousness expanding. It's all these things. How and why did it end up being that way? Uh, because that's God, God's will for us. And I just stepped into it. I said, well, of course. And I just stepped in, in, into it in my lifetimes. And it's, people are getting to the point where they don't want to uh, settle anymore. So now they're stepping into that. Um, do I think more and more centers can and should and teachers do this? Yes. Um, do I think that there's dozens and dozens on the planet? No, not yet. Um, teachers have to, authors and so on, they have to start thinking of themselves as part of the group that they're talking to. It, it can't be listen to me or I know more because immediately I, I wouldn't want to listen to you now. We have to recognize we're in this together. Um, bodhisattvas, enlightened ones, Jesus himself says, I'm always with you. He, he, Jesus didn't say, well, I'm out of here. Good luck. <laughs> he says, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to be here till the end of time. That's the attitude these authors and teachers and healers should have. Um, and I've said this before, don't call yourself a healer if, if you're always focused on how exhausting your clients are. Don't, fo don't call yourself a healer if you're always on vacation. No offense. Take vacations, but call yourself whatever other thing you are. You're an acupuncturist, you're a body worker, you're a Reiki practitioner. Be that and go on vacation. Healers do not do such things. Healers are always thinking about being healers. And teachers, always teaching. Parents, always parenting. It's, it's who we are. It's not something we do and then take a vacation. This is, a, in my opinion, this is a consciousness we all are, are the better and the world is a better place when we step into it. Your soul's purpose isn't a career. It's who you are being expressed. So it's not temporary. It doesn't come and go. It's not like that. And I, I would love to see more people in the world getting that, especially when you need a chiropractor or whatever it happens to be and they're on vacation again. Uh, never mind. Go to somebody else. You know, don't settle. And same with love, romance, relationships. Find more people that, that have that affinity with you to live this and be this as much as possible. So thank you for being with us. We're going to, thank you, dear. Please stand for our closing prayer. Those of you watching online, we want to thank you. And remember, I remind you every so often, you're not watching from a distance. I swear to you, it is our intention to include you here, right? Yes. You're right here with us. You're right here with us, and we're there with you. Yes. And um, you can, anybody, you know, you can watch us. If you watch us on YouTube, be sure to uh, subscribe. And if you're watching on Facebook, you know, do sharing and all that. I, 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 don't, I don't ask you, I don't want my message, like, spread out to the world. I know that sounds weird, counterproductive. I really don't. I don't want you bringing your mother-in-law to these services when she doesn't like it. Uh, um, Share on Facebook with people you think would like it. Don't, don't push anything I'm related to onto anyone, because I don't believe in that. I know you get more people, you get more sales. I don't need any of that. Um, share where you feel guided to share. I prefer, I'm not, a, I'm not a converter. I like working with people who have open minds and hearts, same as Unity of Sedona and our board members and our attendee members. I, I, I love that. I, I go for that. I love open hearts and minds. People that get into overthinking, they don't need to be here. People that get into doubting and all these, 
find someone else to work with you. Um, but um, we, I want to, last couple things. The next uh, Sedona Psychic Fair is today. So you might still have some spots open, but check it out. We have some of Sedona's finest intuitives, psychics and readers. You, we've got that going on today. It was already mentioned, but um, I've got my workshop next weekend, Healing the Heart and Soul. Join us if you can. Sign up for that if you can. Um, and I think that's about it. Um, continue showing up a few minutes before the hour so that we can end earlier and earlier. All righty. Uh, let's see. All right. Um, and by the way, our yard is somewhat complete, the back area. You guys are welcome to go there. I know it has gates and they're shut. And you're, some of you are saying, are we allowed to go in? There? Yes, it's yours. So go in there. It's a beautiful space. As many chairs as we can put out, benches as we can put out um, for people to relax on. The labyrinth is there. And it's going to get uh, developed more, but that's available to all of our attendees. Attendees. Not people that need a place to sleep for a weekend. It's, you know, and then <laughs> we've had it happen. Um, it's, it's it, you know, it's for our attendees. So enjoy it. All righty. The light of God surrounds us. We have the, light of God. the love of God enfolds us. We have the, love of God. the power of God protects us. We have the power of God. And the presence of God watches over us. We have the presence of God. Wherever we go, God, God is, is, I am, we, we are, are, and so it is. is. God bless you all. Thanks for being with us. Bye-bye.